Well, we kind of kicked this whole thing off talking about hermeneutics, and um, I guess that's the root of all of it. It's how you look at and interpret the Bible. And the last time, we were looking at the term apocalyptic, you know, apocalyptic language. And so I guess we're going to continue in that vein and look at literal versus symbolic. And the um, amillennialist will also accuse the dispensationalist of not being consistent in his hermeneutic as well. Kind of ironic, but I want to focus on one small little part. We'll do these a chunk at a time, but um, just looking kind of passage by passage. A passage that the amillennialist will bring up often is uh, Joshua 21. And there's some other passages there in Joshua and uh, maybe First Kings, First Kings 8. The amillennialist will say that, hey, we take that literally um, about the land promises that uh, Moses spoke forth to, the, to Israel, to the Jews. All that stuff is literally fulfilled. But the dispensationalist doesn't do that. So that's one of the complaints. Because remember, as I asserted last time, part of the problem is you, you need to get rid of Revelation chapter 20. Because Revelation 20 talks about a thousand year kingdom period on the earth. The amillennialist will say that most of them will say that the kingdom is now, but it's in heaven. And um, so this isn't speaking to anything that's out there in the future and not running for a thousand years. What we come up with with Joshua 21 is, well, the promises are fulfilled. So there is no future kingdom to look forward to with those passages. There's that promise needs to be fulfilled. That land promise was already fulfilled. It was already a done deal um, right after the Pentateuch. The first five books, and then we go into Joshua, and boom, there it is. Long before there was Moses, God made Abraham land promises. Moses reiterated the Abrahamic promise, of course. But what is Joshua 21 about? So in Joshua 21:45, we read that not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So put a period on it, put a nice neat little bow on it. That's it. According to Alma Onis, it's, it's done. But um, it's good to be reminded that chapter breaks are not in the original text. So that is the way that chapter wraps up, And um, but that's not where the story ends. Because in the very next chapter, uh, chapter 22, at that time Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You've not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only being very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. So then what happened? Joshua said similarly to them again in the next chapter when he was very old. He's again cautioning them, be careful. In other words, God's discipline is still in play. They don't get a free pass to sin, and just as in the wilderness, they don't get to run willy-nilly and, and go about and sin and worship other gods. So they're, they are cautioned. What's in the next chapter, it says in verse 12, it says, For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you, and make marriages with them, so that you associate with them, and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord God has given you. And then look at verse 14 says, And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you has been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and Go serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given to you. So Joshua died. And we read about this period in, in Judges. We read about it in Judges chapter 2. It records his death. And then what happened? Beginning in chapter 2, we have, um, now the angel of the Lord went up to went up from Gilgal to um, Elkim, and he said, 
I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is, it you, what is this you've done? For now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Just as he's saying, right? And you look down at verse 11, it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, for among the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the land of the surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. And this continued going, right? History will verifies this. How many times were they enslaved, trotted out of their land? And so um, does this mean the land covenants void? All bets are off? No. Though not eternally, God judges Israel generation by generation, just as in the wilderness generation, he, he judged them and they didn't get to go into the promised land. Um, but a remnant did, and it's, it's always been about a remnant, right? Um, the future prophets in their respective books, they reiterated the eternal promises, the land promises that would come to pass. Um, we should look at some verses, but first let's go back before Moses and look at the original Abrahamic promise, okay? So Israel became known as the promised land in Genesis 12. So all the way back there, I mean, God clarified it in Genesis 15 that he would give this land to Abraham's offspring. So this wasn't, turns out this was not a two-way covenant and not a two-way handshake type of a deal. Um, but as the custom goes, it went like this. Genesis 15, Genesis 12 was just, I'm going to give you um, the land on these borders. And then he, God expands on it. Genesis 15, we read starting in verse 8. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? In other words, he didn't want to doubt God. There was a lot of scripture written before Abraham, maybe the book of Job, possibly. So there's no history there. So Abraham's saying, uh, you know, how do I know that you're going to do this, God? And so the Lord said to him, um, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. When the sun had gone down, verse 17, and it was dark, behold, a smoke fire apart and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring, give this land from the river. I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Can't believe I got through all those sites. In dividing the animals by himself um, and walking among the pieces by himself, the Lord signified a one side of promise. What it was, this, the tradition was that Abraham would understand was that you make a covenant with somebody and you go and you cut the pieces and the two parties, after cutting the pieces, they pass between the pieces and they signify a covenant with each other. In other words, meaning that if you, we break this covenant, whoever breaks the covenant, what happened to these pieces here is going to be you. Well, Abraham's, or Abram is on the sidelines and God's saying, oh, I'll show you that I mean it. And he did it himself and walk among the pieces by himself, probably um, a Christophany, the incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, um, walked among the pieces, signifying when it's just one person, it means it's a promise, one-sided contract, and that was from God. So God is the only one who has to keep that, comp that promise. That doesn't mean he doesn't have to, he can't discipline them and judge them for their evil and their wickedness. But it just means that it's a one-sided promise. And, and so what was the nature of the promise? If you go in to see, he made the promise in Genesis 12. He doubled down in Genesis 15 here by walking among the pieces. Then Genesis 17, he tripled down, if I can put it that way. In verse 7, he says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you your offspring after you, the land of your surgeon sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, no one's going to say that God didn't know what was coming, didn't know that they were going to break the promises, yet he made a promise. Would he have done that if he intended to break it, or knowing 
that they weren't going to keep it. And so it's two sided and it was never going to come to pass. But God made that promise. So God knows everything and God is sovereign. So God established his plan the way it is. So not only is the promise for the land, but for an everlasting covenant, all land for an everlasting possession. So has it been an everlasting possession yet? It hasn't been everlasting. They fell into judgment. They lost the land, got it back, got come back in land, lost it, came back, lost it, got it back repeatedly. In fact, uh, during the much vaulted 70 AD period, they also lost the land. You know, it's only been in the last century that they've been able to come pouring back into the land. Mark Twain commented on how desolate a land it was, a desert in the 1800s. So that is, if not the, it's a million, million dollar question, is uh, if that's not the Jews over there, who is it? Where in the Bible does it ever promise that the land is going to go to someone else or say that somebody else is going to go in that land? And we can talk about the DNA testing that reveals uh, that the people that are over there are the Jews. And in fact, they've been able to identify all 12 tribes. And they've identified uh, Levites who are being trained for the priesthood even now. So God assured them in Deuteronomy 29 and 30, uh, those two chapters, that they will lose it. But that God will see that they possess it again afterwards. Um, Deuteronomy 30 verses 4 and 5 says, even if you've been banished, the most distant land under the heavens. From there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. At one time, possess the land within the borders. They've yet to see the ultimate fulfillment, the full promise, which is that they would possess the land forever. That was part of the, the land. That was part of the promise, that they would possess the land forever. So while they at one time possessed the land within those borders, they have yet to see the ultimate fulfillment of the full promise, which was that they would possess the land forever. Um, if you want more, let's see. How about Isaac? In Genesis 26, 3, by saying, uh, stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. As the Lord spoke to Jacob also in Genesis 28, verses 13 and 14, the similar words, when he said, there above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. So it's not some new land. It's that very land. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And then well after Joshua, well after Joshua, we read in Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, says, Say and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in their midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So it's showing that it's going to happen, they're going to be there. It's going to be in the, in the land here on earth, in Jerusalem. Um, look at Jeremiah 7, 7. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. So no, not even just for a thousand years. Whatever that thousand year period is or the kingdom period is, it's going to be forever and ever. No, it's not in heaven. It's where you lay and dwell in the place that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Not in heaven and not just for a thousand years. This promised land is forever and ever. But uh, no, I believe this, the, the kingdom goes on after the great white throne judgment and continues on to eternity and future, whatever that looks like. I haven't seen, yours and heard, nor is it even in the imagination of man what God has in store for those who love him. So ignoring the duration of forever, note the aspect of this place in which the land that I gave to your fathers. I think that's key. Um, Amos 9 says in verses 13 to 15, Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. So that establishes the era. And the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people, Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens, eat fruit from them. And I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled from the land I have given them. So they're not going to be taken up and uprooted a third time. Once they're back in the land, they're there. No, they're going to dwell where their fathers, where they lay, where their fathers walked, 
in the land that their fathers have been inhabiting, and they're no longer they're going to be pulled out from it. Isaiah 55, verses 12 and 13 says, uh, For you shall go out with joy and be laid out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Oh, symbolic language. See, we know what that means, right? Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And Joel 3, 16 to 20. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Has that happened yet? Did that happen after 70 AD or somewhere around there? We're looking at the second coming here. So he's going to roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Well, so Israel's going to still be around, and it's going to be a hope and a strength to them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. Because okay. it's a future situation that hasn't happened yet, has it? So this is clearly a kingdom passage, passage that shall run from generation to generation and forever. Um, these would appear to indicate specific current locations during the millennium that will nevertheless continue afterwards. Yet possible that God will simply remake and, and name these new places the same names. I don't know. The Lord spoke to uh, Isaiah. And to others about scattering the people among the nations. This uh, did happen for an extended time, beginning in 70 AD. So they're scattered among the nations, but it was never intended to be permanent. Now, again, Isaiah 11, 11 and 12 says, In that day the Lord will extend his hand a second time, not a third or fourth or fifth time. God will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamalath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed Judah from the four corners of the earth. And that's this is what's been happening since you know, the last hundred years, thereabouts, right? Close to it. Here's one more passage to consider. Ezekiel 37, 25 says, And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, Israel, right? His name was changed to Israel. They shall dwell in that land that I've given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein even they and their children and their children's children forever. Is that clear enough? And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Um, just to reiterate the permanence of it all, read the, uh, the following verses again. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and there shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. They shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst during the kingdom forevermore, because that hasn't happened yet, right? Um, Ezekiel 42, 6 says uh, of this millennial temple, he said, um, Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. This place, this temple, my throne, here, among these people forever. So Jesus has a lot of thrones scattered over. He can put a throne wherever he wants and as many as he wants, right? So I lean toward understanding that the Lord, his tabernacle, the temple where he will dwell with his people during the millennium is established as eternal, which means that whatever eternity future looks like after that thousand year kingdom period, the kingdom will continue. Um, will include this eternal tabernacle in a renewed and rebuilt Jerusalem on a renewed and refurbished or refreshed earth within the renewed heavens. By the way, I would like to say, because I'm terrible about asking this, uh, but hit the subscribe button, please, if you will, and like, and um, share it. But if you hit the subscribe button, it'll, it'll really help. And then um, I can actually name this channel whatever I want. It's a relatively new channel. All right. Thanks.